size of things. Leslie has a wealth of knowledge about the butterflies of London and this amazing publication, which we're all just so excited to see, is the fruit of many years of work surveying, um, looking at the you know, great wealth of data that we've now got available for, um, for us in London, putting that all together into a wonderful publication. Um, and he's obviously our butterfly recorder. So we're very grateful to him for all that he contributes to the LNHS. And I'm gonna hand over to, you to him now for the London Butterfly Atlas. Over to you, Leslie. Good, good evening. Oh, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, yeah. perfect. Come over. Yeah, good, good. So welcome. So thank you for um, attending this evening. And um, I'll, I'll give a run through of the uh, London Butterfly Atlas project. Um, first of all, thank you very much to everyone who's been involved in the project over several years. So it's been really, re really good to uh, have so many people involved. And um, I hope that's uh, reflected in the results of the, of the survey. So... Um, is that coming over? Is that screen coming over okay? Yes, yeah, that's it... yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good, good. Because I've probably seen something slightly different from what you were seeing. <clears throat> so, so I start with um, so I start with the nineteen eighty survey. So Colin Plant, who's um, referred to earlier in the meeting. So Colin Plant um, organised the first butterfly atlas of the London area, and. Before that, there were no maps of where butterflies occurred in London. So there were records of, say, you know, seven speckled woods or wherever they might have been in Putney and two in Hounslow. Um, but it didn't really amount to a map as such. So perhaps only the people who were studying butterflies would really have an idea in their heads of where butterflies were. Um, and that information wasn't readily available. So the original atlas um which was organized between the years of 1980 and 1986 was the first for london to actually map the distribution of butterflies across london and also in a wider area and i'll come on to that one in a moment um and this gave us a much better idea of what, where butterflies were and the distribution and um the 1980s atlas was based on the London Natural History Society recording area, which is a 20 mile radius from St. Paul's Cathedral, demarcated as a stepped polygon of tetrads. Um, tetrads uh, being um, a measure on the Ordnance Survey that covers the country. So a tetrad is two kilometres by two kilometres square. So that gives you a four square kilometre. And um, you'll also hear about monads in this talk. And monads are just one kilometre square, so it's one kilometre by by one kilometre. And um, if you're interested, particularly in butterflies, then um, Colin Plant's um, book also gives a lot of information on the first historic records for butterflies um, in London, sometimes going back to Elizabethan times or earlier. So, so this is this is the 1987 area. You can see this step polygon, 20 mile radius from St Paul's Cathedral, which is about there, um, includes the whole of the Greater London area, um, but also includes some of the surrounding counties as well. So you've got Hertfordshire and Essex um, and Kent and Surrey and a slither of Buckinghamshire. And um, this one is the map for the orange ship butterfly and you can also see also just by the way of record these these dots each represent a two by two kilometer square and the, the 10 kilometer squares are represented by these larger larger squares and <clears throat> as i mentioned each of those smaller squares will have a um <clears throat> will have four one kilometer by one kilometer squares could be So coming on to the um, the current survey, so we had a lot of different recording methods. It was decided quite early on that it was probably going to be more useful to focus on Greater London, bearing in mind that Greater London was a sort of a large metropolitan urban area. Obviously, it's got a lot of greenery, um, but also it's very, very much um, a recognisable area that many people will recognise and a bit easier to understand than perhaps the 
the step polygon from um, central London. But also bearing in mind that since the 1980s, the charity Butterfly Conservation have greatly expanded their, op their activities. And each of the county areas around London come all the way into the centre of London. So there's some overlap there. So you've got the Hertfordshire, Middlesex branch, you've got Essex, you've got Kent, and you've got um, Surrey coming in towards, towards London. Um, so we focused on Greater London and the survey years was 2015, 2019, slightly less than the 1980 survey. Um, but however, we tried to replicate the, if you like, the constant effort of the, between the two surveys, um, but we, we can't ever be sure whether that was achieved or not, or because there are different recording methods and different timescales involved. But we did take a lot of records in. Um, there was one of the things about London is there's already quite a number of butterfly surveys taking place. So to some extent, we could draw upon those surveys rather than ask people to start from scratch. And many people are also involved very much with local sites or with transects or with particular groups or with particular surveys. So it seemed useful to use that, pull into that, pull in that information. And for example, um, we've had a lot of um, interest from the Friends of Park groups, local community and conservation charities, um, the Diocese of London, the Croydon Birders, um, groups in Bexley, um, recorders at Cross Nest and elsewhere. We also had records from the Green Space Information for Greater London. We work closely with uh, Giggle, as it's often known, um, on the on the mapping. And also we're working with Butterfly Conservation and the many surveys that they organise, including their branches, um, the big butterfly count, garden butterfly survey, wider countryside butterfly survey, and more recently, the introduction of iRecord. That did, however, leave some gaps. Um, a lot of the recording in London is done on green space sites. A lot of the recording for butterflies is done on the best sites. Um, that means uh, some areas don't get recorded as best as good, good as others. And whereas we could try to have establish a rigid demarcation of covering the whole of London in 10 kilometre squares. That just didn't seem to be um, practical and wasn't much appetite for that. So we had to work out how we we're going to look at those gaps. And we introduced a system gap recording by which as we as the records come in, we could see which areas were not getting as much attention as others. And then um, a few small numbers were head down to those areas and recording those areas and gradually reduce the size of the gaps. And um, it was very interesting. Um, but if you give us some idea of the gaps, and you're looking at um, large suburban areas, large urban areas, areas of warehousing, light industry, um, the areas like that, they just don't get don't just don't get recorded usually for butterflies. So. You, looking at those, we could get more coverage than just by looking at the green spaces alone. So, difficulty with London is, is well, where do you start looking for butterflies? Um, do you start in the centre and hope you might find some, and you possibly will? Um, or do you go a bit further out and look back in? And um, for example, um, the view from Norwood Park in Lambeth, and here you can see there's a lot, a lot of London. He's quite well treed. You've got railway lines and then embankments and cuttings. You've got nature areas, um, as in the lower part of this um, photograph, where you've got um, long grass and um, small wetland habitats and other things. So there's there's a lot of wildlife there, and in fact. London, as you probably know, has got 1,600 sites which have been uh, called sites of importance for nature conservation. And some of these sites are very small, some of them are really small pocket parks. Um, some of them are quite large, of Richmond Park, and you've got Rainham Marshes, and you've got Trent Park, and you've got areas in the north of Hillingdon, and Bentley Priory around Harrow, and the Welsh Harp. Uh, Hampstead Heath. Um, you've got around the south of London, you've got a large number of chalky areas, uh, Hutchinson's Bank and um, the sites managed by the Corporation of London. And then you've got the River Thames itself, um, some of the central London parks and so on. So there's a lot of wildlife there. 
1600 sites and um if you're ever trying to survey for something and you want fairly good coverage in london then trying to get around to 1600 might, uh, might So, right. right. Say something firstly about um, transex. Um, transex is one of the recording methods which we use. Um, it, the transex basically a, a, a set wall which is walked um, throughout the year between the beginning of April and the end of September, and um, it's walked once a week, and. Um, it's very good for recording the butterflies in a particular area because each record is can be grid referenced automatically. And it, also the really great beauty of transits is it shows change. And the national scheme for transects was originally set up in the early 1970s through experimental work um, done nationally. And then there's a national scheme set up in 1976 and that involved about 80 sites initially rising to 116 after a small number of years. And there was one site in London, which was at Hampstead Heath, which was walked by Ray Softly. And that was great. Um, but also some independent transit started to establish from the late 1980s onwards. And um, by 1990, there were about eight transects in London, including Hampstead Heath. So there were seven that were walked independently, the main site. And... There's just a side story here that um, the, 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 site, the independent sites were offering their results to the national scheme and the national scheme were turning around and saying, we can't take you on, you know, we, you're not a national nature reserve, you know, you're not good enough for us. Um, you said that, that sort of um, feeling you had, but actually what the problem was, was that the national scheme just didn't have the administrative support, nor at that time the software to handle large quantities of data. So the independent start site started doing their own analysis and pulling the data together and gradually building up into larger and larger schemes, some of them covering regional areas, some of them covering chalk down and some of them covering Southeast England. Um, and after a while, as the, as the um, software developed in the 1990s, it became easier for uh, the national scheme to start reincorporating or incorporating the independent sites into the national scheme. So by about the year 2000, the national scheme was saying, yes, come and join us. You can come and join us. Um, so that was quite a takeoff after about that. Um, and by about the year 2000, there were about 19 plus transit sites in London. And then they were gradually contributing their results to something that became to be known as the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. And now we're regularly walking about 30 transects in London. So we're getting a lot of data in through that. So that's that's really, really useful. Um, and um, it's, it's one of the, one of the, the best ways to, to get butterfly records, although it doesn't cover any wider than the actual area itself that the transects walked upon. Um, so I just also say thank you to everyone um, who does walk transects. I know many of you in local rotors. Um, I just mentioned my local area. Thank you very much to um, Michael Berthold, who's walked the, walked the transits part of the rotor in my local area for many years. And also I pay tribute to Simon Mercer, who also walked the transect for many years, but passed away earlier this year. So transects are good, good, good exercise. Um, they're based on criteria that butterflies or adult butterflies, when they're warmed up in the morning and they're warming their flight muscles up, they'll be on the wing. So they'll be flying and much more conspicuous than they would be when they've got their wings closed and they're inactive. Um, and above a certain temperature, almost all the butterflies will be flying. So the survey works on protocols for shade, temperature, time of the day, sun and shade, wind speed and rain. And um, if you get it right, it can sometimes be quite um, frustrating if the weather's changeable, 
then you can get away and um, do do the survey. So taking all the surveys into account, we ended up with um, this this map. Um, this this map has been swept clear of all the personal data, so um, that it complies with the um, EPA requirements of data protection. But basically. Um, what we wanted to ensure was every tetrad in London was covered by the survey. And um, in the end, we did achieve that. And you'll see, if you look at the grid, it's just around the coloured areas, so you can see the monad squares. And um, we probably had coverage from about 60% of the monads, um, but not from all the monads, but on a tetrad basis, we achieved total um, coverage. But when I say total, obviously some tetras have far more results than others, so there's some imbalance between them. <clears throat> um, excuse me. Then once the records are in, that's a case of um, what's known as verification, because obviously records are coming from a large number of sources, so sometimes there's erroneous records or people transpose records. Um, so those need to be sorted out. And I think you can imagine we get high, what, quite a large number of records that were just not plausible. But we also got quite a few records which were possibly plausible, but we had to need to do a bit more investigation. And at the end of the survey, depending on what you can, we ended up with about 187,000 records for the covering the five years. Uh, some of those piled up quite highly in some places and a little bit less coverage in others. Um, we had about 470 data files. And as I say, each of those 187,000 records had to be verified before they were accepted into the project. Um, we also wanted to do this comparison with the 1980s survey. And um, uh, one of the problems was, was that due not to the London Natural Society, but to a third party. Um, it appears that the records from the 19, um, 1980s surveys have not survived and doesn't appear to have been a backup. Um, so in order to map those, we've had to extract the records from the 1987 atlas as a single centred record of one token butterfly for each, each, of, the, each of the squares. Um, just as a way of interest, uh, uh, again, I mentioned the gap survey again. It's quite interesting in some of the urban areas like this. This is a roundabout in Dagenham. And um, it's here that there was um, small heath butterflies were flying around quite freely here. And yet, if you go to places like northwest London, it's a lot more difficult to find um, small heath butterflies, even on acid grassland. <clears throat> Many of the urban areas turned out to be quite um, rich in some of the species of butterflies. Um, so here we've got a comma, um, which is at um, Southwark, not far from the Thames. And um, I'll just very briefly run through the, the groups of butterflies. I won't go into the details. Um, or the, the talk this evening is not following this order, but this order is followed in the Atlas book, so um, that's the proper way of doing it. But um, basically in London, we've got a few main groups. We've got the skippers, which include quite a few grassland butterflies, and the fairly small butterflies, some of them hold their wings at different angles. Um, we've got the, the whites, which include this, the green vein white and the large white, the brimstone and other species. There's the, what's sometimes known as the browns, which include the larger, generally larger, but also the small heath, uh, meadow brown, speckled woods, uh, but also marble white, which such, um, isn't exactly brown to colour, but it, it is a brown butterfly. Um, then you also got um, some of the fritillaries, like the silver wash fritillary, the white admiral, purple emperor. Then you've got the group that includes the, the red admirals, the comma, the um, peacock, small tortoiseshell, Glanville fritillary. Just touching London, you've got the Duke of Burgundy, uh, although mainly as a wanderer. Um, there's a small copper, four species of hair street butterfly, and then there's the blues, which include the small blue, uh, holly blue, and the common blue. And um, the... Um, 
small white is um one by five just just checking that you can see this map so i've got i've got um, my gallery is obscuring part of this so you you can see it that's 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 okay um yeah it's fine good good thanks um so the small white this is um this is about as you see this is the map showing the distribution for greater london in the 1980s and i think with a map like this you can assume that um, where there's a few gaps you know that the there's there's butterfly will also occur in there it's it's so ubiquitous and very similarly with the um 1915 sorry 2015 2019 map um you've got a few gaps um but i think we can say that the small white occurs in all of those squares and then there's a wall butterfly um the the wall is also is is a member of the brown family um and um the um the map here you can see in the early 1980s um there's quite a few gaps it what the the wall butterfly wasn't the most common of um butterflies um it was you would see it occasionally but it was widespread you can see from the map here that it was widespread and it's probably occurred in some of the squares that are not shown there you you also notice uh, one thing here is there seem to be less wall browns or walls as the wall brown used to be a name for the wall there used to be less walls in the south of London than in the north. And that seems to be that at that time there was um, this wall was becoming more scarce in a pattern that was moving up from the south of England, um, although it was remaining on the coast. And we were recording the, oh, the, the wall was being recorded on transects in, in north London. And throughout the 1980s, and then this happened. Whilst the, the wall had been fluctuating from year to year um, in the late 1980s, we came to 1990, and the numbers suddenly dropped. And then they dropped again, and dropped and dropped and dropped, and that was it. The wall was practically locally extinct in London um, and it wasn't until about 2014 possibly with a wanderer that was unconfirmed or about 2018 that we started recording uh, the wall back in London again. Um, so there was a big dramatic change and one that showed up um, from the transit results and um, that's the current map. Um, there's also one from South South London in the last few years after 2019. Um, there's some in the Kent and Essex area alongside the Thames Estuary. And they seem to be flying in. We can't confirm this stage whether we've got a breeding success. Um, but they the wall has been recorded both on the south and the north side of the Thames, um, near Raynham and Cross Ness and um, areas, areas near there. But you can see otherwise... It's gone. Um, it's gone from the whole of London, but we hope that this might be the start of a recolonisation. Then meadow brown. Um, meadow brown is a very common brown butterfly, um, and um, its um, its it, abundance is probably one of the most abundant, possibly the most abundant butterfly in London. But it, it tends to occur in the areas where there's rough grassland, hay meadows, uh, rather than in urban areas, although it does fly into urban areas. Um, it's called the meadow brown butterfly. Um, it's not called the pasture brown. It lives in meadows primarily. Um, I think hay meadow brown would be an even better name. It likes um, vegetation that's cut once a year. And um, I mentioned also on this graph that we were taking these graphs back to the, to 1990 in this case when we had eight transects in London and that's fine for this sort of work but if you want to do statistical work you really need to start about 2000 when we had about 17 transects that gives you a bit more confidence in your data um, so bear in mind some of the maps vary and also some of the maps were very depending on the year in which uh, individual transects started and just mention here just an aside from the, the survey in terms of how do you best manage uh, hay meadows or grasslands for the meadow brown butterfly? And um, one of the things we have from experience is that the 
the pupa emerge from the grass, well, where they attach the grass in the late spring, probably about late June. Um, once they're on, the, if, the, if, the, if the grass is cut before then, then you can lose basically 90 plus percent of the number of adults you would get. But after, after they've emerged, after the large majority have emerged, then after the cutting from then onwards, um, the later the cut in the year, or the more you can delay the cut of a hay meadow, the more adults you'll have flying in that year. But that's not the end of the story. Because as you do that, you are also altering the habitat. So in terms of a hay meadow habitat, the, hay meadows, the meadow brown actually prefers a habitat where the hay has been harvested earlier in the year. So although later cutting can increase the number of meadow browns in the year in which you're actually in, the um, earlier cutting can improve the habitat for the meadow browns in subsequent years. And that's due to various reasons, including... If it's a hay is taken as a crop, then you can you've got shorter day length hours as the year goes on. You've got more chance or less chance, put it that way, of a period of dry weather, and also the palatability and the digestibility of the hay decreases, which might not be an issue to the butterflies, but it is an issue um, to um, farmers and to cattle or horses who may be taking the material. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, False oak grass, which the meadow brown uses, but not as much as nowhere near as much as other grasses, um, it also becomes more dominant if the grass is cut later, and also you can have problems with creeping thistle and ragwort. Um, so it's a difficult um, dilemma. Um, it, where you're trying to manage an area with a mosaic of grasslands, uh, different times of cutting, different areas, some areas not cut in any one year, that could be even better because you might also be wanting to conserve other species. The so skippers, for example, prefer grass that's maybe cut uh, not more than once every two years um, so it can be a complicated uh, equation and um, if you're on chalk grassland areas then you even got even more um, species of um, the blue butterflies to think about and to consider so moving on um, the speckled wood and um, speckled wood you'll be very familiar with um, around gardens parks around buildings and you can see this map from the early 1980s. And you can see here in this case, you've got the speckled woods more common in the south of London and the north of London. And it was at this time that the, the speckled wood was moving north, um, to in effect colonised parts of north London. Literally, um, you could see that see that happening as the speckled wood moved into And now you can see the speckled wood is um, practically covering the whole of the uh, London area. And um, if we now look at um, the establishment, this is a this is a transit for Hampstead Heath, and you can see the um, speckled wood was absent for the first two years that the uh, transit was running. You got one or two coming in about 1982, and then about 1987, it's it's suddenly established, and you've got a population which will then fluctuate more with respect to wider environmental conditions. The gatekeeper. Now, this is one that Colin Plant mentioned was um, was perhaps the only circumurban butterfly in uh, of London in the early 1980s. You can see it occurred in the edges of London, but not in London. And um, well, what happened here? Again, this this um, species moved into London, and um, again, this is this is from Hampstead Heath. And you can see there were no gatekeepers until about 1985. And then just one or two, and then then have established population, and you then got a population established and and permanent. So that's the gatekeeper now, um, and I think we can assume that it's covering or it's occurring all to almost all of the other tetra squares on that map. The ringlet. Um, you now, when when I was um, when I started recording butterflies, if I needed to look for a ringlet, I needed to go out somewhere like the countryside around Hemel Hempstead to find one. And um, here we've got the map for the early 1980s. Hardly any in London, although quite a few on the chalky areas in, in the south of London. And then this is the map for 2015 to 
2019. So they moved in, and that movement was very much during the last decade, and it still seems to be occurring. And um, again, if we look at the look at the map, this is Hampstead Heath. You see, Hampstead Heath Transit started in 1978, and there was nothing till about 2008. So there's no ringlets, and then they've then they've established, and then they set up populations. Um, the ringling is perhaps a little unusual for um, British butterflies. It tends to uh, occur in damper grass and quite a few other species. Um, it was sometimes flying drizzle. Uh, most other butterflies would take cover at the slightest um, rain that occurs. It also has a tendency very occasionally to come indoors at night, um, so setting itself up on window panes or sometimes on painted plaster, and um, they can then be gathered up and um, released in the morning. And the marble white, the marble white, as I mentioned, is also brown. Um, it's um, absolutely unmistakable when you see it in flight. It's like a flying chessboard. Um, it uh, really likes knapweed for the nectar that they produce, um, although it's a grassland plant in terms of its, uh, its larval requirements. And you can see here, early 1980s, hardly anything, even outside of London. And then... For one reason or another, maybe climate change, it's swept across parts of England and South East England. And then you've got this pattern where it's been moving into London during the, during the last few years. And um, we took two sites here. We've got Riddles Down. And Riddles Down is actually on the chalk in the south of London. It's one of the sites managed by the Corporation of London. And you can see 1990 to 2004, no marbled whites. And then you started coming in, and then again they've taken off. And um, Horsington Hill again about the same time as that was happening in Riddlesdown. Horsington Hill is in the Ealing area, is the northwest of uh, London. So um, you can see there's a population there. There were one or two anomalies. There was a population um, established at the Welsh Harp um, on the Brent Barnet border in about the year 2000 uh, or two just after, and then that that going, but it didn't didn't seem to spread much beyond the Welsh Harp. And then the brimstone, very different story here. Um, the brimstone is a butterfly of country lanes um, and um, it's larval food plants, the older buckthorn or the common buckthorn. So it's a very, uh, it's very specific requirements, but it's quite an easy one to, to cater for. And um, if we look at the map of the 1980s, early 1980s, you can see it's quite strong in the south of London. Uh, coming in there was a Bromley, which has got quite a bit of open countryside, South Croydon and Chalk chalky areas, less so in the north of London. And in fact, at that time, there were eight London boroughs in which the brimstone was not recorded in any of the six years between 1980 and 1986. And um, the thing is with the brimstone is that it can be very easily attracted by planting the alder buckthorn. And um, the larvae, feed on the leaves and you can see this characteristic pattern where the leaves have um, been munched away by the by the caterpillar um, the, the butterfly the adult butterfly will find the alder buckthorn very quickly um, if you plant it it can sense somehow sense the chemicals produced by the leaves of the plant from quite a distance so it's a very easy to establish and we'll we can't claim all the credit for this. Um, we did give it a helping hand. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a project to plant all the brimstone uh, whips and trees across North London from Ealing and Barnet, Brent in allotments, all the way to Tower Hamlets. Um, even Kew Gardens didn't have an order back for in their collection. Um, so... By doing that, we quickly established a lot of um, local populations. And um, for example, again, Hampstead Heath, 1978 to 1992, nothing. Um, there was a brimstone recorded at Hampstead Heath in about 1911. Uh, but that gives you some idea just how few there were. And then it's establishing and off it goes. And um, Bean Hill, similarly, and um, Kingsbury area, Northwest London, no, no brimstones, plant the older buckthorns and the uh, the brimstone starts start to establish so that's been a success story and uh, we're very pleased with that and um, the brimstone now covering much more of london um north and south um and um, we think it's spreading further okay um 
we've got um, the blue butterflies um, and, and also some of those of um, chalk down and areas. So in particular, the dingy skipper, grizzle skipper, silver spotted skipper, dark green fertility, Glanville fertility, small blue, Donis blue, chalk hill blue. Um, these are all uh, butterflies which in the early 1980s, as now, are very much confined to the chalk districts. Um, in the south of London, Croydon, south of Bromley, um, perhaps going into, into Sutton. Um, some of them have spread. There's been some wonderful conservation efforts in that area through Butterfly Conservation, uh, Corporation of London and others. Uh, so some of, these, uh, some of these species are moving up slightly further into Bromley and touching the Bexley border. Uh, just occasionally you get a wanderer. Um, or from a records point of view, we have to be very careful when we get records of small blue butterflies because people often see small blue butterflies flying around and they often turn out to be common blues or holly blues. But just in case you will get genuine uh, wanderers. Uh, so there's a lot of very detailed conservation work goes into conserving the butterflies of chalk down, chalk grass. And of course, we've, there's the London Wildlife Trust Hutchinson's Bank site, which is absolutely wonderful in terms of the uh, conservation efforts there and species um, which are present. So what are the possible reasons for um, change in London? Um, so all species fluctuate from year to year. Uh, so you can get some quite dramatic changes. Um, you, you can have effects from parasites, can affect um, species such as holly blue. So you get cycles of predator-prey relationships with numbers building up and then crashing. Um, you get our migrant species are dependent on many factors. The weather can be sensitive stages of the life cycles. Climate change is a big one. There's all sorts of effects um, on butterflies. Habitat loss and creation and management are very important. And also possibility of actual pollution itself, although it's sometimes very difficult to see a direct cause and, cause and effect. So that one's um, a bit more difficult to show, but you can, for example, get nutrient enrichment of grasslands, which can affect the um, quantity of different species of grasslands and which may affect the finer leaf grasslands on which many uh, butterfly species grow. So talking about that one, the, the brown arcus is one of the, the blue butterflies. And um, here it's um, photographed at Good Maze Park in um, Ilford. And if we look at the map from the early 1980s, you can see it's very much um, in the south of London, actually corresponding to chalky areas. And that's because it's um, food plants, a common rock rose. And this, um, this is from the... Uh, plant atlas of the early 1980s. Um, so that, sh that shows you the distribution of the brown argus. And if you look on the right hand side, this, this is the distribution of the brown argus now. So what's happened? Um, is something going on? And what the theory is, is that the brown argus has had an ability to take advantage of climate change and for warmer conditions it has spread further but then it has spread beyond its food plant range and so it's had to take up alternative food play uh, food plants so this um this 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 map is the dove's foot cranes but this is 35 40 years old so it might not reflect the current distribution but it gives you an idea it's obviously a lot more widespread um then he, and he's a lot more widespread now than, it, than the um, original food plant. And again, another food plant that the brown argus is using is the cut leaf crane spill, which is very common in areas, some areas of London. So uh, that's what is thought to be occurring there. Um, and um, it could, London could be an example of uh, just show that that is the case. Holly blue. Uh, this is perhaps the most common butterfly and the most one you're most likely to see in London. Uh, it's far more common than the common blue over much of London, although the common blue is probably more common on the chalk areas in the south. Um, its main larval food plants are holly and the ivy, but it's also got, also got a taste for quite a few others. Um, and if you ask me, I would say this butterfly is the one that's got the most closest affinity with London. Um, it's, it occurs actually numerically it's more abundant in London than it is on the Green Belt out beyond it. So it's, in, it's an interesting species. Then we've got the, the, the Red Admiral. Um, 
the um the red admiral is a good navigator um it flies far it's often migrating from europe and breeds in the uk um some now over winter here which is something that seldom if ever occurred in the 1980s although it was widespread in the 1980s and but numbers numerically in abundance have increased and we've got the small tortoise shell um and um i won't show you the map but um Colin Plant, right in 1987, wrote that beyond all shadow of doubt, the small tortoise shell is the most widespread and common of all our butterflies, occurring, as the map shows, in every tetrad of our area during the survey period from 1980 to 1986. And this is another one, like, to some extent, not quite as bad as the wall, where numbers plummeted um, from about 1990 onwards and then from about 2000. 1992 was a particularly good year, for the butterfly, um, but numbers have dropped. And you see this zero here rather than the, the bottom axis. This is actually the zero line. So you can see it's dropped dramatically um, over the last few years. And um, I'll say a bit more about that in the moment. We're not quite sure the reasons for it, but it could include predators um, that um, from that have been introduced from Europe. Then we've got the brown hair streak. Um, this has been a tremendous success story. The, the brown hair streak is a specialist butterfly. Uh, it lives on blackthorn as the larval food plant and some other species of prunus. Um, it's, um, it didn't occur in London or it just occurred in London in the 1980s, just. Um, and um, it lays its eggs, a tiny little pin sized eggs on the stems of, of blackthorn. And um, it also uses trees like these in hedgerows in london which these are um one of the closely related bullis species um so it'll also lay on this um and it's spread really dramatically since uh, during the last 10 years and um if i could just say and this isn't science but but it's an observation from the results which are in for 2024 um and i choose my words carefully because a lot of the transects are on green space and nature reserve sites rather than truly representative of the suburban, urban and warehousing areas of London. Um, but nevertheless, the transects are really representative of the areas that they cover. And from looking at the 30 transect results for which we've got this year, the small tortoise shell has been less abundant in 2024 than the brown hair streak. So there's been tried to change fortunes of two two butterfly species there. Uh, what may just be that this year has been a sickly bad year for the small tortoise shell. I mean, it certainly had its lowest abundance since our record started in the 1978. And there was no doubt the small tortoise shell was common way before 1978 too. Um, so um, very briefly, I hope I'm not overrunning the time. Um, so um, this is a, the butterflies usually divided into some reg some groups which include the habitat generalists the regular migrants and the habitat specialists and um, the regular migrants don't require much explanation the habitat generalists are species which could occur anywhere if they're given sufficient general habitat um, and the specialists require some sort of special specialist food plot special habitat it's a bit of an arbitrary definition but it works very well in England and, and Britain and um, with um, looking at the survey for London, we've come up with a list of about 20 species of butterflies, which are generalists for London. And these species could, if you provide the necessary food plants and habitat for them, could occur practically anywhere in London, uh, in, a, in a small park, maybe in a back garden, um, uh, wayside land. Uh, so they include the ones we've mentioned, and also the Essex skipper, small skipper, large skipper, small copper, um, peacock, commas, orange chip, red admiral, painted lady in the clouded yellow. Um, and then you've got the um, the se several species which are considered generalist species nationally, but which appear to be behaving more as habitat specialists in London, which are the wall, the small heath, and the white letter hair street. And then there's habitat specialists themselves, which include the dingy skipper, Grizzle skipper, small spotted skipper, dark green fertility, um, the small, small blue, Adonis blue, chalk hill blue, 
silver wash artillery, white admiral, purple emperor, and the brown hair streak, um, and the green hair streak. So just looking at a few of the habitats, um, this is this is the amply named Butterfly Lane um, in uh, South East Nine. Um, I know the uh, road name needs a bit of a clean up, um, but um, you can see you can see the sun reaching both sides of the lane. Um, a mix of habitats, some introduced shrubs, but a lot of the original ones from the original hedgerows. So it's really good for for butterflies. Lots of food plants in the hedgerow edges, uh, lots of nectar sources uh, for the for the butterflies too. Um, and then going over to also uh, Eltham, um, Wellhill Pleasurance, um, lots of um, very active methods for introducing wildlife into areas and um, logs, which can be valuable for a wide range of wildlife and also sometimes for hibernating butterflies and also the grassland, which can be used for many of the species which are breeding. And again, that's something that can be replicated in um, back gardens or small parks. Um, it can be done um, very easily. Uh, sometimes the grass becomes a bit straggly towards the end of the season, so they will cut it about September. Um, and always even on front gardens, um, it can be done too. Um, you can get sort of um, cellular uh, grass crease or other products which can take the weight of vehicles summer and winter, but at the same time can allow a chalk down the meadow to be seeded over them and provide wildflowers. Also the grassland um, species for butterflies and also for other insects like uh, bush crickets. So I'm conscious of the time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who's contributed towards the project. Uh, butterfly conservation, the recorders, uh, Giggle, the big city butterflies, and also the team within the London Natural History Society who have navigated this project through the graphing, the reviewers, and everyone else. And so um, the, the atlas should be um, delivered by Christmas. Um, if you get your orders in by the end of the month, there's a pre-publication offer. And um, uh, thank you. I'll uh, I'll end it. I'll end my talk there. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Leslie. That was really fascinating. I like the way you went through the sort of different fortunes of different species and. It, it is fascinating, you know, think ones that are doing well and have expanded their range, others where you've kind of had this huge um, drop off in how well they're doing. Re and I, I like the way you ended up with some positive kind of ideas about good management techniques that are really going to help the whole range, the whole different you know, different species. And we often, you know, often they are, they're 